Well, welcome home, church. Thank you. It is such a pleasure to be here with you this morning, worshiping our Lord and Savior. Hey, I have to tell you, this past, these past couple days, I have seen the Church of St. Paul's at work, and I have seen God working through them. I was able to go on a short mission trip with uh, some youth from St. Paul's. We got to serve all over Decatur. Yesterday, we got to go to the zoo and share God's love at the zoo, and so um, it was so neat to see God moving through them, and, and it's such a blessing to be able to see God moving here this morning as well. Today, we get to hear from Pastor Mark um, as God speaks through him, telling us about why we need the Old Testament. Hey, if you are a guest, we have a wel some welcome material out at the welcome desk just for you. Uh, let's take a look at our weekly blueprint. Welcome home, church. It's good to come together as a family of faith and worship, whether you're here in our sanctuary or joining us online. At St. Paul's, it is our mission to love God, build the home, and change the world. Looking for ways to put it into action in your life? It's time to get started. Here is your weekly blueprint. Friends, before the summer runs out, it's about time to make a few more family memories while also getting out and sharing the love of Jesus in your community. Get your wristbands now for the 2018 Decatur Celebration. Along with our fellow sponsors, we welcome you to enjoy the Christian stage August 3rd through 5th. Experience local musicians along with incredible music and worship with Jonathan McReynolds, Love and the Outcome, and Crowder. And we're there to make your experience more enjoyable with the SPL Family Oasis. Whether you have a baby to feed, a diaper to change, or you just need to have a seat and cool off, our family will be there and ready to serve you. As a church family, we value learning and growth through the love of Christ and the difference this kind of education makes in the lives of children and youth in our community. Your continued prayers and support of the ministries of St. Paul's Early Learning Center and Lutheran School Association helps us to connect children with a quality education and relationship with Christ from the precious early years through young adulthood. If you know parents or caretakers of three- or four-year-old children, let them know that now is the time to register for preschool at St. Paul's Early Learning Center. Preschool classes begin the week of August 27th. More information is available at elcdecatur.org or call 424-9183 to schedule a tour or register today. It's almost time for back to school for our Lutheran School Association. Registration days for this school year are next week, August 1st and 2nd at LSA. Then for all LSA families at St. Paul's, our pastors are hosting an SPL family meeting just for LSA parents. You will need to attend either on Saturday, August 11th at 7.15 p.m. or Sunday, August 12th at 9.15 a.m. These meetings will take place in the family room just across from the sanctuary. Watch your mail for additional information. Contact the church office with any questions at 423-6955. Friends, we appreciate knowing you are here in worship with us. Be sure to complete one of the member or guest connect cards available in your pew and pass it to the center aisle during offering time. Have a prayer request? We're glad to pray for you. Add it on the back of your card. You can always find additional information about everything coming up at SPL in your worship guide or connect online at spldecatur.org and through Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you have any questions or need assistance while you're with us, our team is happy to help here in the sanctuary or stop by our Welcome Center. Now let's get on our feet, church, and get ready to worship. It's time to greet and welcome one another. Good morning. Once more, I say welcome to everyone and welcome if you are watching on our live stream. We're so glad that you've joined us today to worship here at St. Paul's. 
If you are like me, I can get bogged down and fix my eyes on whatever I'm struggling with at that moment. And for each one of us, we have our own struggle, our own burden, whatever it is that you fixed your eyes on. But you come to worship to fix your eyes on Jesus Christ, to change our gaze from what's happening in this world to what is happening eternally for us and what has already happened, which is the victory, which has been won for us. So when you think about those struggles, today we claim that victory over our struggle, over sin and over death. We begin our worship in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Lord God, thank you for being present with us in worship. We honor you with all of our praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Lonely in my sorrow and dead in my sin. Without hope, with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested, and my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty.
The excitement we have in what Jesus Christ has done for us is such a beautiful thing. From Galatians chapter 1, verse 3, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. He is our rescuer. We have a brand new song called Rescuer that is all about what Jesus Christ has done for us. He's our rescuer. He's our rescuer. We are free from sin forevermore. Oh, how sweet the sound. Oh, how grace abounds. Lord, you have freed us from the shackles of sin and shame and guilt, and we thank you for that. But God, there are times that we don't necessarily live that way. We continually put the shackles back on ourselves, or we continually put that shame back on ourselves and that sin, and God, we need your help again. And so God Almighty, we confess together um, the words of our confession, Lord, I have stumbled and fallen short of your glory. Instead of seeking the abundant life you have given me in Christ, I've continued to seek my own will 
and the things of this world that lead me to death. Forgive me, Lord, for my unfaithfulness. Restore and empower me by your Holy Spirit, that I may live more fully as a beloved child and representative of your kingdom. Friends, we have a rescuer. A rescuer that's taken away all of our shame and sin. And even though we continue to try and put it back on, he continues to forgive and take it back off. And so I announce to you today that that shame and sin that you've been holding on to is gone. It's no more. You are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We go before the Lord in prayer. <laughs> Almighty and everlasting God, we thank you for who you are today. We thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy, and we thank you for celebrations, for joy. We thank you for the 95th birthday of Luella Lange. May she continue to love others through your love. Almighty God, we thank you for the birth of Adeline McAvoy to Rachel and Pat. May you keep mom and dad and baby healthy and safe. God, give mom and dad the courage and the ability to bring up Adeline in the way that leads to the love of your holy and precious word. God, we lift up to you those who are hurting, who are sick. We pray for Robin Reaver and Lynette Messamore. Janet Faust and Mike Williamson. Lay your loving and comforting hand upon them. Let them know that you are God, that you have created them and know them intricately. And guide their doctors in wisdom and gentleness. Almighty God, we thank you for the life of your saints, and we thank you for the witness of your love that was Tom Brower. We pray for comfort and peace over his whole family as they continue to mourn his loss. And God, we pray that you would place your healing hand upon all who are mourning loss, all who are hurting, especially those here in Decatur who do not yet know you. Allow us as the church to fulfill your calling of, of going out, of showing your love. God Almighty, you have sent us all out today. And we especially lift up to you the 12 youth and their leaders who, who showed up when you called them to be missionaries. Continue to grow your kingdom through the seeds that were planted in their work. And Lord, as we as the church support these people serving, and those that had served in Texas, Lord, stir our hearts to look for where you're calling us to serve. Lead us with courage and strengthen us as we go out and do these things, as we love your people. God, all of these things we lift up to you, praying the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You can go ahead and be seated. We're going to let all you kids go for uh, SPL Kids Church Time. And as the, the little ones go, we're going to invite the uh, ushers forward to collect uh, back what God has given us through our offerings and tithes.
today, church. Lord Jesus, as you come to meet us here today through your word, Lord, uh, we are just so thankful that you would come to us because there was no way we could make our way to you, Lord. And as you come to meet us here today, Lord, may my words be your words. And may you open each person's heart, Lord, that they might hear exactly what it is that you have for them to hear today. And that as they go from here, Lord, you would continue to lead and guide them and draw them to yourself and the life, the abundant life you have to offer them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, we are in the midst of this series, What's in the Bible? And really uh, seeking here to kind of, for one, join together what our kids are learning with what we are all learning in here. Uh, But also just for us, it's good to come back and see what is it uh, that is in Scripture? Why uh, do we hold to the truth of Scripture? And last week, Pastor Bill uh, talked to us about the importance of the Old Testament, that it's not just some compilation of stories about some people that lived long ago, but it is in reality our story. It's the story of how God's faithfulness in the midst of our human brokenness continues on. It's the story of our people, God's people, to which we have been grafted through Christ. It is not unimportant or obsolete but it is still vital and meaningful to speaking truth into our lives and pointing us to God and his promises in Christ. But it's only in light of the witness of the New Testament that the Old Testament comes fully to life. It is only through the lens of the New Testament that the full purpose of the Old Testament and God's promises of salvation within it are truly revealed. It's the New Testament witness, the gospel that transforms the Old Testament from just a bunch of stories about the people of Israel to a book of promise and hope for all people that points to God's ultimate restoration of his sin-broken creation. And that's why it is the New Testament, this blessed gift of God's word and witness that is going to be our focus here today as we seek to answer this question, why do we need the New Testament? And I don't know about you, but to start off with, right, you think about that question, it kind of seems simple, right? It's a no-brainer. It's that typical Sunday school answer. Oh, thank you guys. Woo! Thank all three of you guys. I appreciate that. (laughs) Yes, right? Jesus. Because, well, that's what the New Testament tells us about Jesus. And it's all about Jesus, isn't it? He's the one who saves us. He's the one who forgives us. He's the one who gives us new and everlasting life. And yes, this is so true. This is the central message of the New Testament. But there's more to it. Because you see, truly knowing who Jesus is, it also reveals who we truly are and how we are to live our lives. So maybe the better question for us to ask here today is, who are you looking to? Where are you looking to for life? Now, I think one thing that can be easy for us to do uh, is to kind of simplify how we see Old Testament and New Testament. And we can fall into this trap of just thinking that the Old Testament, it's it's the law, right? It crushes you. And the New Testament, oh, we love that because that tells us the gospel, that beautiful, sweet, good news of Jesus. But this is kind of a false separation, a false dichotomy, because if you look at the Old Testament, there's both law and gospel there, and the New Testament contains law as well. And actually what we see, what the New Testament reveals to us is that all of Scripture points to Jesus. He's the central focus of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, from beginning to end. The Old Testament is filled with promises, prophecies, and events that anticipate and foreshadow the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. 
And if you were in our adult Bible class today, you saw in that video, there's 300 plus prophecies that are fulfilled by Jesus in the New Testament. These prophecies, uh, these things in the Old Testament pointing to Jesus, they're from things like Genesis chapter three, where just after the fall, God makes this promise that there will be one, an offspring of Eve that will crush the serpent's head, the enemy's head, and will restore the creation. Or things like the Passover lamb, which was slain and slaughtered so that the people of Israel would be saved, that it was the blood of that lamb as it covered their doorpost, that it kept them from death and freed them from slavery. To Isaiah's prophecy of this servant of God, the suffering servant who would be despised and rejected, who would be wounded for our transgressions. And it would be by his wounds that we would find healing. Again and again throughout the Old Testament, God points to his ultimate plan of salvation through Jesus. But the reality we have to realize is that this truth, this reality in the Old Testament, it's veiled. It's much like a shadow, right? You can't clearly see or, uh, what it is. You can't fully make it out. It's, it's just a shadow. And it's only in seeing the real thing that the shadow actually fully makes sense. You actually come to realize what it is. And in the same way, it's only in light of the New Testament witness that we have uh, of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection that Christ becomes fully visible in the Old Testament. The New Testament makes clear what was one time hidden. It shows us the real thing through its clear witness of Jesus as the Christ and the Son of God. As Michael Horton says, once we truly grasp the message of the New Testament, it is impossible to read the Old Testament again without seeing Christ on every page, in every story, foreshadowed or anticipated in every event and narrative. You see, Jesus is the lens through which the Old Testament is seen clearly and fully. And yet at the same time, Jesus not only makes sense of everything before him, but also everything after him. Through his death and resurrection, he established a new kingdom, the kingdom of God here on earth. And he established his church, a kingdom that he has promised will not fall and will continue on into eternity. And it is through the witness and the testimony of these New Testament writers, of the apostles and the many followers that have come after, that he continues to grow and build his kingdom and his people, the church. Even today, here in our own community, God continues to seek to use his people to grow and build his kingdom, to use you and me. He calls us to bear witness, to share what he has done in our lives, to share that good news that his kingdom might be grown and built. You see, Jesus is not merely the center of all scripture as we see. He is the center of all time. All time finds its meaning in him. And we can see this from the way that we, we mark time uh, as a people, right? Our dating system, all of history is marked and measured by how far before or how far after the birth of Christ it is. Isn't that amazing? 500 BC is 500 years before the birth of Christ. AD 2018, where we are living today, is 2018 years after the birth of Christ, after the year of our Lord. Christ's entrance into the world, into the world it has indeed changed and left an everlasting mark on this world. And it's only in light of his story that all of history makes sense. And it's only in light of his story 
that your story and my story make sense. He alone is the one who reveals who we truly are. Jesus alone is the one who brings meaning and purpose and clarity to our past, our present, and our future. He alone is the one who gives us true life. And this is the power and the purpose of the New Testament witness. The Apostle John says it this way at the end of his gospel. Now Jesus did many other signs uh, in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ and the Son of God. And that by believing, you may have life. Life everlasting in his name. True life, yes, into eternity before, because we know that our Lord Jesus, he has conquered death. He has defeated death and through faith in him, through his glorious resurrection, we too now have received that victory over death. We no longer have to fear it for we know that everlasting life Uh, is ours in him. But it also is life here and now that Jesus gives us. Life here and now is only found in him. Now there's many in this world, and maybe even some of us here today at times, we like to think that we have this life figured out, right? Uh, that we can do this on our own. We know how the, this world works. Uh, and, you know, we know the secret to life. But the reality is that unless we are allowing Jesus to guide our way, unless you know him intimately and are letting who you are and what you do be defined by him, you are only fooling yourself and you are living in darkness. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17, So I tell you this, and I insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, that is, chasing after the things of this world, chasing after their own desires and the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their mind and their understanding. They're blind to the reality that is before them, and so they are separated from the life of God because of their ignorance. See, so often we like to think that we have this life figured out, that we can do it on our own. But the reality is, if we continue to seek to live life our way, the way we think best, if we continue to chase after the things of this world to find purpose and meaning and comfort, we're only going to be left empty-handed and disappointed in the end. And friends, I speak this truth to you, not just out of the witness of Scripture, but in the experience of my own life. And maybe you've experienced it too. I've experienced it in my own life, and I've seen it in the lives of others. Only a few short months ago, I had the privilege of being able to go to a conference in Atlanta uh, about small group ministry. And as I was on my way back from that conference, I... I took a lift, it's, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's kind of like the modern day taxi, right? From the church there to the train station that would take me back to the airport. And as I was going on that ride, I got to have a conversation with this young lady who was my driver. And, and quickly it became apparent to me that not only was she not a believer, she really had not heard about Jesus. She knew nothing really about the faith, about the church, about God and who he was. And as we continued that conversation, I began to hear in her story and the things that she was saying, the emptiness, the disappointment, and the deep longing she had for something more, something to give meaning and purpose to her life, to to bring her to life. She had sought all these different things of this world. She had sought to to find it in the stuff of this world, going on these big spending sprees of trying to fill herself up with, with stuff. 
in making money and having a successful business, in the next relationship. But it all left her empty, longing for something more. And the amazing reality is I got to share with her what it is is my hope, what it is that speaks meaning and purpose into my life as I shared with her that I believe that God uh, created each of us uniquely, that he had a purpose for us. And as that it was in him that I found my purpose, my meaning, my very life. And I continue to pray for her each and every day that God will use not only what I said, but what so many other people might be saying to her, that he will lead her to believe that truth, that he will lead her to seek him out and that he will bring her to faith in him, that she will discover that true life, that everlasting life, that freedom that comes only in Christ. And friends, I pray for each of you here today that that is where you are seeking your life from as well. Now, I want to go back for a moment to John chapter 20, right? And that uh, declaration of John of the purpose of the New Testament. But this declaration, it also reveals to us three kind of foundational truths about Christ. That Jesus is, uh, sorry, about Jesus, that Jesus is the Christ, that he's the son of God, and that he is the one who gives us life. And these foundational truths, I want to spend the rest of our time digging into these, although we're, we're kind of familiar with them, because as we've said, who Jesus is, it really reveals and defines who we are. So the first one, Jesus is the Christ. As we declare, as we believe that Jesus is the Christ, what we are declaring there is that he is that Messiah, the one foretold from old, the one that from the beginning at the fall there, that God promised he would send one who would stand in our place, who would set things right once again, who would bring restoration to his creation and would save his people from their sins. And as we make this declaration, as we believe this to be true, we are also declaring something about ourselves. And that is this, that we are unable to save ourselves and that we are in need, dire need of a savior. That we have failed and that we have fallen short and that there is nothing that we can do to save ourselves. And this is really the witness of the Old Testament. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 6 to 7 tells us, But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. For if the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. Now, it might be kind of weird for us to to think about that uh, this covenant that God enacted, that it had a, a fault with it because we think God is perfect. But when we look at the first covenant, the problem with that covenant was not God, it was us. The problem was that we could not fulfill our part of the deal. Again and again throughout the Old Testament, we see the people of Israel say, yes, Lord, we will follow after you. And then they seek and follow after the things of this world instead. And as we read those, as we see uh, those stories and we read them, we realize that this is our story too. That we too uh, fall short. That we too continue to seek the things of this world. And we can do nothing to save ourselves. As Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the good news that we know is that God took matters into his own hands. He came down as one of us to take our place and to step in the gap. Through his perfect life, Jesus fulfilled the righteous requirement of the old covenant. He fulfilled it and so it is now obsolete. And through His death and resurrection, 
he established a new and greater covenant, one that did not depend on what we do, but only depended on what he had already done for us. Now you may be thinking, okay, Pastor Mark, I've heard this over and over again. Why are you saying this to me again? And the reason is, is because I think we still forget this. Even though we think I know this, it doesn't actually play out in our lives, right? Because we continue to keep trying to do this life on our own. We continue to to put our comfort in our own strength and what we can do to find our comfort in our own accomplishments and achievements instead of what has already been accomplished for us in Christ. Our comfort, our hope, our confidence, it comes, it is found only in Christ and his sacrifice for us. We need to stop trying to save ourselves and start believing in Jesus realizing that he is the one who sets us free to surrender ourselves to him and trust him alone. Now that second truth is that Jesus is the son of God. And as the son of God, Jesus is the perfect reflection, the perfect image of our heavenly father. Jesus reveals to us perfectly and fully the true heart of God, the true character of God. Hebrews chapter one, verse three tells us, Jesus is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Now, so often people think of God as this uh, mighty being, this creator who's just looming over us. He's watching down, just looking for us waiting for us to mess up, right? So that he can bring down the hammer, that he can punish us for our sins. But what Jesus shows us as the son of God is that God is not looking to condemn us. He wants to save us. He wants us to believe and trust in him, to come to him, to be in relationship with him because his love is so great and unending. We hear that for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Because God didn't send his son to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus shows us the heart of God, that God is love at the core of his being. And that his love for us, it never ends, it never changes, no matter all the the wrong that we do, or no matter the great accomplishments we do, God's love remains the same for us. It never ends. And it is understanding that love that never ends. It is as we come to understand the height and the depth, the endless bounds of that love, that we are freed to live for Christ that we are freed to live not out of a compulsion of fear of his anger and his wrath, but we are freed to live in the joy, to follow after him, to live as the child of God he has made us. Now that final reality of, of who Jesus is that speaks to who we are is that Jesus is the one, the only one who gives us life. He is the full source of life, the only place where we receive that life. But I think something that we often forget or something that we don't realize is that we think of this life that Jesus gives us as something that we will receive in the end, right? We cash it in when we die and we go to be in his presence. That's when I receive that life, that everlasting life with him. But the reality is, is that our new life in Christ, it's already begun. Our eternal life is ours now through faith. We don't have to wait till we die. It is our present possession here and now for all who believe. Even now we can experience the glory and the joy, the beauty of his kingdom. 
And yet that's hard for us to believe and imagine, isn't it? Because we look at the world and all we see is the brokenness that sin causes in our world. We look at ourselves and all we see is our failures and our sins and the ways that we continue to fail to follow after him. And we, it's hard for us to believe that this is true for us now. But it is, my friends. And the way that we grab hold of this everlasting life right now, the way that we receive its benefits and its blessings is through obedience. That as we follow Jesus, as we trust him above all else and put into practice the things that he tells us, our life here becomes a foretaste, a foretaste of the fullness of life we will experience in his presence for all eternity. This is what sanctification is all about. It's not about us sinners becoming more holy, becoming saints, no, in Christ, Jesus, or God has declared that we are already saints. We are already holy in God's sight. We are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. What our sanctification is all about is grabbing hold of that life more and more, living out who we have already been made to be in Christ that more people might see it, that we might, uh, God might through us bring heaven, bring his kingdom to earth. As we follow Jesus and seek to put his words into practice, we enjoy this amazing fruit of our new life in Christ, the fruit of hope, of comfort, of joy, of peace, of self-control. And guess what? Those around us, Enjoy its beauty, its greatness as well. So friends, I'm going to leave you with a question here today. And the question I want to ask you is this. Where are you looking? Where are you looking for your source of meaning and purpose and life here and for eternity? Are you continuing to look to yourself and your own strength? Are you continuing to look to the things of this world to fill you up? Or are you looking to the one who is the way, the truth, and the life? The one who sustains all things, who created and redeemed all things. I pray that he is the one that you are looking to. And as you look to him, I promise you, I know and I am confident that he will sustain you and bless you with life in abundance here and forever. Amen. Friends, stand on your feet. Find someone near you to be able to share that love of God with, to be that loving presence as I speak these precious words of God to you. May the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord look down upon you. May he pour out upon you his unending favor. And may you have his joy and peace within you. Amen. Let's sing praises to our Lord.
church, thank you for being here with us today. Go out in peace and serve the Lord this week. Amen. Amen.